Hello everybody and welcome to From MySQL to Pinot, our journey. In this talk, we're going to talk about how we move from MySQL cluster to a Pinot solution. First, I want to run through you through the agenda. We're going to have an intro, then we're going to talk about the history of AdStats pipeline at Etsy, why a new iteration, the Pinot implementation at Etsy, incremental release of the new Pinot cluster, migrating historical data of two years over to the Pinot cluster from MySQL, and at the end, but also around all this talk, you're going to learn a lot of different things about our journey. First, let's talk a little bit about me. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Luis. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, with a lot of interest in real-time analytics and solving problems in a distributed manner. Uh, my hobbies are dancing, DJing, and playing chess, in that order in particular. Um, and dancing, if you ask, dancing salsa. I love it. Uh, but that's enough. that's enough about me. Let's just get into it. Um, I want to explain first what are ads at Etsy. If you have ever used Etsy, you have come across these many, many times. Whenever you search like, in Etsy, you'll find ads everywhere. Um, it's a really good product for sellers to gain exposure in the platform. It's really easy to set up, and it works with a cost per click model. And it's really easy to get going with this. Now. I want to talk to you about what our team does. Um, our team is called AppLab. It's short for App Platform. And we basically are in charge of maintaining the pipelines so that your ad stats get from what you see in the screen to databases under the hood. And now I would like to, I would like to talk to you about the history of ad stats pipeline at Etsy. This is going to be a series of iterations that made us go from what it was to what it is now. Now, for the Visio, basically, this was the first architecture that I familiarized familiar myself with back in 2014. Um, it's dated from back in 2014. And basically, the way this works is that, as you can see, there's a front event that triggers a, an event on the front end, and then it goes to memcache, right? And then once that's in memcache, we have crons that basically are triggered every minute. And then in a uh, async manner, we trigger workers, which made this saving, this saving of the data be in parallel, which is great. And once that's done, we have different resolutions for each of the tables. We have hourly tables, daily tables, and yearly tables. This was great. This was awesome. But it, it had many challenges. It was heavily coupled. We hit scale issues at some point. Etsy doubled its traffic, and some of the stats that we were recording will take hours to get to our sellers, which was not great, and it certainly wasn't real time. The good things, though, is that it was everything in one code base. That was really, that was really great about it. You will change everything in one place, and everything will get deployed. Once we got these scaling issues, it was, it was apparent to us that we needed to actually do something about it. And that is how the V1 was born. OK, Luis, did you just change two things in the slides? Yes, I did. Um, because that's what we did. We changed the means of tra transportation of the data. Basically, we went from a cron-based solution, a memcache solution, to a Kafka Streams application that will make our data be more streamlined or more real-time. Or oh, that's what we thought. Um, now, there are some challenges here. It wasn't still really super real-time, especially for the impressions pipeline. Save it, saving data to MySQL, which is what we use, felt really foreign to our architecture. The code was all over the place. We have different repos and all that stuff. And new slices of the data were hard to, was hard to achieve. The good things about it is that we had up to a minute delay on the clicks pipeline, which means that the sellers could see their data coming through really fast on that pipeline. And then we had a five to 10 minute delay impressions in the impressions pipeline. That went from hours to minutes and seconds into, in these two pipelines, which is great. Also, we got the coupling. And in order for us to scale the data, it was easier than before. Now, you may ask, Luis, this sounds great. What do you need a new iteration? It seems like the system is working well enough. Based on our last slide, you can sort of see how we might hit eventually some scaling issues. And 
basically not, not only scaling, but product features, new slices of data, new representations of the data. That m means that our team had to come up with something else as well. So our team started asking ourselves these sort of questions. We wanted different ways to visualize the data. What does that mean? Data is important, and it helps make yourself informed about what's happening in your business. And you take more educa educated decisions based on that. Along with this, we ask ourselves, how do we show users new representation of the data? How can we help them make better decisions? If it's faster, if it gets to them faster, it means that they'll act on it faster. As developers, can we support these kind of products with frameworks or tools out there? Given this, we thought that a MySQL schema was not really the best, the best fix for this feature. And this led us to eventually see into Peanut as a new data store for our products. Now, the Peanut implementation at Etsy. End of last year, our team was tasked for, to create three different prototypes that will mimic the implementation of one of our products that we have currently in production. Among these technologies, of course, there was Peanut. And I'll tell you why we chose it. And now I want to get, I want to give you the problem statement first. This is a seller dashboard. When if you have, if you have ever used ads at Etsy, this is a seller dashboard. You can see it right now. We have two different dashboards. Okay, on the left hand side, you can see that it's basically the aggregation of stats for seller. You see things like your clicks, your impressions, revenue and so on. On the right high side, you can see a more detailed view for each of the products that you advertise at Etsy. You can also turn them on or off, and you can see as well impressions, clicks, attributions per product, which was great. Our prototyping basically meant, OK, this is right now powered by MySQL. Can we power, can we power these same features by something else? So why Peanut? Glad you asked. Well, there are definitely so many things that we found with Pino, especially persisting data is great and it feels so native. As you can imagine, with our previous iterations, we had to roll new apps, we had to do amp, we have to code endpoints for that, uh, or clients that go from Kafka into MySQL. And that was not really native. We have to do a lot of code to deal with that. We had to deal with errors that happen on the HTTP calls and all that. And to be honest, it wasn't that fun. The other thing that we loved about it is that everything was done with JSON Cofix. It feels really codeless or like almost no code. It's very highly available and full tolerant. It fit our use case to perfection, especially the aggregation features that come with Peanut. Data is queryable in seconds after ingestions as opposed to minutes or hours. All data can be written and migrated, especially if you're using offline servers. You can spin new representations of your data in no time. It is very performant and much more. So how it started. So OK, we had this cool new product with us, Peanut. OK, how can we implement it? And you have all of these technologies that you can see in the screen right now. Peanut, Kubernetes, Zookeeper, CICD, Helix, all these things. And our team was not suited to do all of these things. So what we did, though, is that for a proof of concept, we said, OK, let's just learn. Let's see what happens. And you know, let's just, let's just do it. So what we did is that we pulled the Helm chart from the Pinot repo. And then we made YAML files out of that. And basically, we just did kubectl apply all of these changes. There was no CI CD. It was push and pray, and pray to God that everything was OK. Uh, and this served us well for a, for a prototype that was in production. This helped us see what the capabilities of Pinot wa was. But it was definitely not something that we wanted in production by any means. So to the rescue, we partnered with a team within Etsy. This is called the services team. And we are at that team. What, this, what, what does this mean? What does this help, uh, help us achieve? Well, it helped us achieve a lot. Because in the meantime, while we were focusing on the application itself, this being Peanut, the services team could be implementing this for us and making sure that we had a really good CI CD pipeline for Peanut infrastructure. They were worrying about things like networking, alerting platform, securing the cluster, 
high availability and fault tolerant capabilities in Kubernetes and so on. Well, our team could focus on things about the app itself, about Peanut, which is what we wanted to worry about. What about query performance? You know, how can we make CI CD pipelines, continuous integration, continuous deployment, deployment pipelines for schema validations or tables? Integration with our web cluster, which is in PHP. How can we communicate with PHP? Alerting, migration of ads data, and validation of it. So today, thanks to this, this is what we got right now. So it's very much more simpler. Um, we have gotten rid of, of the two Kafka apps that we had before. Now we only have one Kafka app. You might ask yourself why. It's because we use Treft, which is uh, a different representation. And we do not have the capabilities to know how to read that in Peanut this day. Also, this Kafka app reads to into the three different topics and basically accumulates everything into one, then transform that, transforms that into JSON, and that's whatever topic gets outputted. That, that's what Peanut looks at. We also went from three different tables to, one, to only one table. So imagine all that code that we just saved. We do not really need any of these extra endpoints or extra custom logic in order for us to communicate for services that come from Kafka into our web cluster and then into MySQL. This was great. So this is how our architecture looks today. And to get into more detail, this is how our setup is today. We have two different servers, three controllers, two brokers, three zookeepers, and one minion. This in terms of infrastructure. Then we have a setup as well. We have retention of two years on the offline servers and retention up to seven days on the real-time servers. The real-time to offline task is enabled so that we move data that is in the real-time servers to the offline servers. Data uploaded to GCS daily. Partitioning only the ID is enabled. We have Bloom filters, sorted indexes, Drench indexes on, uh, on a drench index on date. Aggregation metrics is true to do early accumulations of data, which is great. This current setup handles 6,000 messages per second, 100 squares per second, two years worth of data. And the most important thing of all is that our average P99 response time is of 15 milliseconds, which is great. Also, we have three different environments. We have production, development, and sandbox. And in development, we also have a development and production. It's important to say that they are like mirrors of each other. And also, the data that they host is the same. This allows us to make changes in development and make sure that they are OK, and then push them up to production. Thanks to all of this, we have data ready to be queried in seconds instead of minutes or hours. We do not need extra apps to accommodate logic, as I said before, like communicating with our web cluster to then save into MySQL. We don't have to deal with any of that. There are less places we have to change things to get real-time pipelines going. There is CI CD pipelines for infrastructure changes that we might not do that we might want to do in Peanut, but there are also CI CD pipelines to make schemas and table changes. Now, I want to talk about the incremental release. At this point, we had real-time data going in our cluster, and we wanted to get a sense of how the request will look like in production. But we didn't want to have all the data in Pinot first in order for us to start incrementally releasing our product. And as you can imagine, this is what was born. A tale of two systems working together. Basically, our two pipelines were working together for a long while which means that the MySQL pipeline, ingesting pipeline, was working along with the pin ingesting pipeline as well. What we had, what we have different time ranges, right? So as you can imagine, if you have already today's data or yesterday's data, you don't need for all the data to be there in order for you to open up those filters because that data has been already ingested for, from Pinot. So the way this entire system works is that we first validate the data with the, with the validator on the bottom, and we basically first we basically check the counts between Peanut and BigQuery in this case. Why BigQuery? It's because we cannot 
making a query like this might be a little bit expensive in MySQL. So we have systems at Etsy that allow us to basically automatically mirror a MySQL table into BigQuery, which is great because then we'll validate the data first. We'll make sure, hey, everything looks OK. This data looks similar. And in our tests, it was almost all the time 0% difference, which is great. You don't want any difference in our data in, in your data. So as you can imagine, as data was getting ready and validated, we were able to open up individual, individual date ranges. And we can also, for that individual date range, do a percentage. So as you can imagine, eventually, you know, we opened for all the ranges and everything was good. So this brings us to today, on June 29th, all our MySQL read traffic to these tables was basically zero. And, you know, very important to note here is that MySQL is a great tool, but, you know, it was time for us to try something else. And this basically brings us to probably the most important part of this talk, which is migrating the historical data from MySQL into Peanut. We did so many workarounds to get this right. I'm really excited to show this to you. Um, and it's probably the, the thing that excites me the most about this talk. So I want to tell you first uh, something about two bugs that we encounter. And it made, this made us make some architectures de decisions from the beginning. Um, so these are the two. The similar name bug, which means this basically meant that if you were ingesting a lot of data into Peanut, some of the segments will end up having the same name. And because of that, we could just not, we could just not run one single job. We had to actually divide it by day. And the Spark runtime bug didn't allow us to use Spark for the entire pipeline, for the entire pipeline that allowed us to move the data from MySQL into Peanut. So here, a tell of workarounds community and how they got us through. This is a tell. This is what we wanted to do. So we have the data in BigQuery. The reason why we have it in BigQuery is because, as you know, you don't want to make these queries in MySQL. So all the data is in BigQuery. So eventually, we want to have this data move into GCS and eventually Peanut. And that's it, right? Sounds easy. Easy peasy. Let's do it. Well, iteration zero. We have BigQuery. Then we have a Spark process that basically takes that data, makes that data be JSON. And then we have the Peanut standalone job grab that data and, make, and put it into Peanut, basically. In that Peanut standalone job, we had a script because we were running this daily for each day in two years. OK, so that was the, the first iteration. What happened then is that we had some errors in the JSON files, and we could not figure why that happened. So we, cha we chose to change it to Parquet in this iteration one. The only change that happened is that we changed from a JSON file to a Parquet file. OK, run the script again. Let's see what happens. If you have ever deal, dealt with queries in Peanut, you know, you know that if you have a high number of rows in your filter, and if this is how it looks like, what, you have, what we have highlighted in red, this is bad. And this means that you're query is going to take long to execute. So we had to ask to the community what was going on. So this is the community part of the tell. So Mayang, thanks to you, uh, he's told us, uh, you know, data is not sorted. Data is not sorted, not sorted. I was like, why, why is it not sorted? We sorted it. I thought we had sorted it, but we sorted it wrong. Um, and this grep command is what we used to use in the Pinot servers in the segments to know if the data was sorted. So yes, data was not sorted. We needed to add this particular line of code in the Spark process. So OK, this makes sense. Let's try to add, that, add this into our pipeline. OK, now we're going to run it with our modification. You know, Let's make these files sorted. This makes sense. OK. Let's do this script again. Let's run it. And boom, you know, time use MS, which is the response time, that looks way better than from four seconds to five milliseconds, like 500 milliseconds, sorry. Um, that is way better than whatever we had set up before. Um, and 
The problem here though, is that if you see, this is development, the numbers that I'm giving, and then we have production. For the same query and for the same data, but the only difference between these two clusters right now is that the dev cluster has all the data from the two years that were migrated. And production doesn't. And we are querying for the same data. What's happening here is that development with all those new segments, for some reason, is having some de decrease in the performance. And we were like, why, why this is this happening? This makes no sense. And you know, this was a new time for us to go <laughs> asking the community. You guys know what's going on here because this is literally no bueno. And it was partitioning. Our data was not partitioned right in Peanut. And what was happening is that in the Spark job, um, we needed to do the same kind of partitioning that we expect in Peanut to happen. If you're ever dealing with offline servers, and if you're ever setting up partitioning, you need to know that you have to have the same sort of partitioning in your job that is ingesting the data and putting it into Peanut and in whatever Peanut spe expects. So this is what happened to us. We had to have a partition with Murmur. Murmur is the algorithm that happens in the Peanut side of things. We asked, the community came through, thanks to Sergi. Uh, by the way, a shout out to him. Um, and yeah, so like we did it. We implemented this code. Uh, we added uh, this new partitioning with Murmur piece of code to our pipeline, ran it again, boom. Data is partitioning, everything is good. And you know, response times are looking really, really, really good. Like that's amazing. Uh, the numbers of segment queried, as you can see from thousands to 97. And then like the number of like files is kind of filter is zero now. This is great, this is what we want. And this was basically, this was all that it took. It was way many more iterations, uh, but basically, this is really compressed as to what happened. Now for the learnings. Um, basically, you know, you have to know your data and index accordingly. It's really important to index your data accordingly. Um, having teams that do different teams for one project is really good as the services team helped us out to achieve this. Invest time to get your data right into Pinot, especially if you have to do offline ingestions in Pinot. Get the data right, you know, take your time as you can see, we, we had to do many iterations to get it right, but eventually it was worth it. Data was retrieved fast, and right now the cluster is really healthy. Release incrementally. You don't have to wait for all the data to be there for you to start releasing. Very important, trust the process, everything works out at the end. If you put the hours, if you put the effort, everything works out somehow. And last but not least, the Pinot, the Pinot community is awesome. As you can see from our slides, they all the time came through. They helped us release this amazing product. And today, Pinot is in production, handling our data just fine. Very many thanks to all of you. And yeah, uh, thank you so much. I hope that you have enjoyed this talk as much as I did. And I hope that you continue to enjoy the Real-Time Analytics Summit.